This technology and AI live session is led by Tom Raftery, Global Vice President, Futurist and Innovation Evangelist at SAP. An inspirational international keynote speaker, Tom is also a guest lecturer at the Instituto Internacional San Telmo, podcast host and a board advisor for a number of startups. Now, before joining SAP, Tom worked as an independent industry analyst focusing on the Internet of Things, energy and sustainability, and also as a futurist for Gert Leonard's Futures Agency. Now, Tom has a very strong background in technology, sustainability and social media, having worked in the industry since 1991. He's the co-founder of an Irish software development company, a social media consultancy, and still finds time to be co-founder of hyper energy efficient data center Cork Internet Exchange. Tom also worked as an analyst for industry analyst firm Redmonk, leading their Green Monk practice for over seven years. Now, you might be familiar with Tom from his uh, hosting of the twice weekly digital supply chain podcast, the weekly Climate 21 podcast and a weekly Tech for Good LinkedIn live show. Now, today, Tom is going to be talking about the sustainability imperative, how technology can help us reach our goals. Hopefully, we'll have time for some questions at the end of the session. But for now, welcome. to. Thank you so much, Scott. So this is a picture of my dad. I took this picture on his 80th birthday. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us. It's not that he's died or anything, but he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's back in 2010. He's now advanced Alzheimer's. So while he's with us physically, he's no longer with us. But I owe a huge part of my interest in sustainability to my dad. He was a professor of agriculture in the local university. And, you know, when I was growing up as a kid, every weekend we would go to farms or we'd go to places in nature and things like that. And it was through that and that th going into the, the countryside all the time, it was through that that I, I developed this strong in interest in nature and biodiversity. The world has changed in this last 18 months. This world has changed enormously. And I'm not talking about COVID, I'm talking about climate. Uh, but because we've had these COVID headlines, you might have missed some of the things that's happened in the, in the climate space. And I'm not talking about some of the climate disasters we've witnessed in the last few months and years, but I'm talking actually about the regulations. China has committed to going carbon neutral before 2060, but more importantly, in the shorter term, uh, China has mandated that all its regions source 40% of their electricity from renewables by 2030. Now, that is a huge, huge commitment, and it's an extremely ambitious undertaking. Not only China, Europe has adopted a new European climate law, which says that we're going to be here in Europe, I'm based in Spain, we're here in Europe, we're going to get, uh, we're going to be net zero by 2050, but we are going to reduce our emissions 55% by 2030. And that's an incredibly ambitious undertaking as well. And not only that, but this has been written into law. It is now legally binding on all 27 European nations. The US has announced that they're going to reduce their emissions 52% by 2030. So again, hugely ambitious goals, not mandated by law yet in the US, but at least this is the commitment of the new Biden administration. Saudi Arabia, not a nation known for its sustainability initiatives. They have said they're going to go for 50% renewable energy by 2030, and they're going to plant 10 billion trees by 2050 in a massive, uh, again, hugely ambitious program. Germany has gone even further and they said they're going to go net zero by 2045. So we can see all of these regions, big economic blocks have got these huge sustainability targets and initiatives over the next eight and a half years out to 2030 and then the following 10 and 20 years out to 2040 and 2050. The global economy 
is about to turn into the climate economy. These goals are so ambitious. Changing to reducing emissions in Europe 55% by 2030 is going to require enormous amount of work. It will mean that every single business decision as particularly the closer we get to 2030, every single business decision will be weighed not just on its financial implications, but also on its climate implications. And it's not just regulations. We're also seeing the investment community come on board in this. JP Morgan recently invested in an ESG investment platform because they can see this is what's going on. Germany, just a couple of months ago, shut down one of its largest coal plants. This coal plant had opened in 2015. It was a six-year-old coal plant. The return on the investment for the investors was wiped out. It was a huge stranded asset. That particular coal plant is actually going to be turned into a green hydrogen hub where they manufacture green hydrogen from renewables, offshore wind. So the investment community know now that fossil fuels are a dangerous thing to invest in and they're walking away from them and heading towards carbon light and carbon zero investments. The energy space has been massively changed here as well. If we look, the uh, OPEC oil minister from the 1980s, Sheikh Yamani, some of you might remember him, he very famously said that the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones, and the oil age will end long before the world runs out of oil. And he's absolutely right. Remember, we talked about reaching peak oil. That has happened. We've reached peak oil, but not that we're running out of oil, rather the demand for oil is falling away. And it's happening not for reasons of, you know, climate and sustainability, unfortunately, but actually it's happening for reasons of economics. Fortunately, because this means financial sustainability, which means this is something that's going to stay. Solar costs have dropped a factor of five since 2010. The price of solar keeps dropping. And it's a beautiful, virtuous circle because it's happening because of economies of scale and the experience uh, learning curve. So as you generate more solar, you get better at doing it. The price falls. It becomes more attractive to more people. You make more of it. The price falls again, becomes more attractive to more people. So you get this great virtuous circle. And you can see from the commitments I talked about from China and Europe and the US and Germany, the amount of solar that's going to be ordered in the next eight and a half years out to 2030 and beyond 2040 and 2050 means that price is still going to continue falling. And it's not just solar, it's wind as well. And now we're seeing in places like China and India and Germany that the cost of solar is now cheaper than the cost of running an existing fossil fuel plant. Let me just say that again. The cost of building a new solar farm from greenfield to new solar farm producing electricity, it's cheaper to do that than it is to fuel an existing fossil fuel plant. This is a revolution in terms of the energy industry space. And because of that, we're seeing massive shifts in this year alone, the first three months, January to March, the new electricity generation that was built in the US was 2,921 megawatts wind, 1,690 megawatts solar, 9 megawatts of natural gas, 5 of water and 0 for the rest. So the world is shifting to renewables and not just renewables. Also, the cost of lithium-ion batteries for storing that energy keeps falling. It's down 87% between 2010 and 2019, and it continues to fall for similar reasons. And it's not just that the price of them is falling. The energy density of these batteries is increasing. It has tripled since 2010. So these batteries are storing more and more energy, increasing 5 to 8% a year, and the price is falling 10 to 15% year on year. And because of that, energy giant NextEra, who is the largest utility company in the US, have said that now the combination of renewables plus batteries, the two together, beats coal, gas and nukes. And so they're, they're investing heavily in the combination of renewables and batteries. Because of that, we're seeing these enormous projects being, ta being taken up now. Kazakhstan. Uh, with a German energy company, are building a 45 gigawatt renewable project to power green hydrogen, to generate green hydrogen. 45 gigawatts, to put that in perspective, a gigawatt is roughly the output of a single 
nuclear reactor. And this is one project where we get 45 gigawatts of renewable power, where they hope to make 3 million tons of hydrogen per year, clean hydrogen, what they call green hydrogen. And if you think that's impressive, two weeks after that was announced, in the 14th of July this year, Australia announced 50 gigawatts of renewable energy development, and they hope to produce 3.5 million tonnes of green hydrogen annually. A few months ago, when I was talking about this kind of stuff, 20 gigawatts was a big project, and now it's up to 50. And this is going to continue happening, again, because the price keeps coming down and the market is starting to take off because i said because as i said the regulations are going to shift and we're going to be required to do it the oil majors the super majors bp orsted iberdrola total nl five of the eight super majors have announced big plans to invest this year that's the green bars in renewables and out to 2030 that's the black bars there so these five of the eight super majors have announced the plans the three super majors who are missing off this chart are on this page. Black Wednesday was the 26th of May this year. And on that one day, the three super majors who weren't on the previous page appeared here because Chevron, ExxonMobil and Shell all had a huge defeat on the same day independently. In the case of Chevron, they lost a a shareholder vote uh, where they were mandated by their shareholders to reduce their emissions by 2030. Never happened before. The investors are starting to get worried and saw Chevron weren't going in the right direction, so they voted down the board. They defeated the board in a vote. It's same with ExxonMobil. There was a shareholder meeting and the shareholders voted in three new climate-friendly directors onto the board. Never happened before. And in the case of Shell, on the same day, a court case was taken against them and it reached a judgment and the judgment came out against Shell in the Netherlands. On that day, the judge required Shell as, the, as part of the ruling to reduce their emissions 45% by 2030 globally out to their scope three emissions. So that's, that has huge implications. If we look at the field of transportation, it's changing enormously as well. When I moved here to Spain in 2008, I bought a car uh, because I needed a car to get around. And my uh, filter for cars, because I've always been interested in sustainability, is emissions. So I bought the, the lowest emissions car that was available at the time, which is the Toyota Prius. Ten years later, I switched up to, in 2018, I bought a Nissan Leaf, fully electric. It was the best fully electric car available in Spain in 2018. You can see here at 51% charge, it had a range of 130 kilometres, so, you know, around 250, 260 kilometres on a full charge. Three years later, this year, I got an ID4, a Volkswagen ID4. You can see there, 90% charge, I've got a range of 545 kilometres. That's how much the electric vehicle space has changed in three years, you know, and that's going to continue happening as well, and the prices keep falling. This is a chart of the range of some of the uh, electric vehicles that are on the market at the moment. You can see there, th this is in miles because it's an American chart, but, you know, we're talking 280 to 350 miles range. So, you know, 500 kilometers, not a problem for any of these vehicles. These are the Mustang Mach-E, the Model 3, uh, the Hyundai Kona Electric. So they're not all expensive cars. The Hyundai Kona Electric is less expensive than any of the ones on the board. The circled one is mine, the ID4 there. And it's not just personal transportation. I love this quote from the former mayor of Bogota, Enrique Peñalosa, where he says, a developed country is not a place where poor people have cars. It's where rich people use public transportation. And this talks to how bus fleets and public transportation globally are going electric as well. London has the largest electric bus fleet in Europe at the moment, but it's still quite small. There's a long way to go. And most other cities in Europe are, you know, making plans to go the same route, not just in Europe. The largest bus fleet in the world is in China, where they have over 500,000 fully electric buses. They're well ahead of everybody else in the space. Uh, trucks are going electric as well. Volkswagen are pouring 2.2 billion into their Scania uh, and MAN electric trucks. Uh, Volvo have launched a fleet of electric trucks as well. Amazon have ordered 100,000 electric vans from Rivian. And here in Spain, when I get deliveries now from Amazon, their Amazon Prime vehicles, you know, about 80% of the time, they're uh, Mercedes uh, electric vehicles. The other 
10 or 20 percent of the time they're citron fossil fuel vehicles but 80 percent of the time at least it's it's fully electric uh, ferries are also going electric and a lot of this again is down to the economics of it and similarly with the buses and similarly with the trucks and, and things like that because electric vehicles are far cheaper to fuel it's much cheaper to fuel an electric vehicle uh, with electrons than it is to stick diesel into a diesel vehicle uh, the the cost of running a bus on electricity is 20 cents per kilometer the same bus costs 75 cent per kilometer if it's fueled by diesel so huge savings there in terms of fuel also in terms of maintenance so f so fleets are going to flip very quickly to electric because fleet managers are only concerned about costs and maintenance and electric vehicles require far less maintenance than internal combustion engine ones because they don't have an engine they have an electric motor which is far easier to maintain food production is another area where we're going to see massive changes food production today looks kind of like this massively wasteful look at all that irrigation there the vast majority of that water is lost through evaporation only a tiny percentage goes up into the roots of the plant whereas if we start growing plants in facilities like this massive indoor vertical farms where we stack them and we we give them led light we start to get a far higher concentration of plants per uh, square foot of, of floor you can get about 95 percent greater plant per square foot and it's important that we reduce the footprint of agriculture and not just the the footprint the also the uh, amount of uh, water that's used is reduced again about 90 to 95 percent in this kind of scenario also you don't require herbicides and pesticides in this scenario so the the, the plants that are the food that's produced is essentially organic and if you're producing it somewhere like this you can do it close to where it's being consumed uh, this is a story about a company called and ever and they have a huge indoor vertical farm in the desert in kuwait they where they produce 500 kilos of fresh greens daily uh, i talked to the cso of this company on my climate 21 podcast you can find that if you go looking for it it's really interesting they're opening a new um massive indoor vertical farm in singapore uh, in the in the in the, in the next few weeks and they're going to be producing one and a half tons of sorry yeah one and a half tons of fresh greens there per day uh, and then we we can move to things like uh, plant-based meat whereas where we cut out the animal and we take the plant food essentially plants and we convert it directly into in this case the impossible foods burger but there's other kinds of forms as well we're now using it to produce fish based uh, meat as well or fish type meat where it comes directly from plants and this space is becoming hugely interesting uh, also the, there's another approach to this where we can actually take cells in kind of like a biopsy operation we just take a few cells from in this case chicken we put it into a bioreactor and we grow up the cells into meat in that way so rather than slaughtering thousands and thousands of chickens we can just take a few cells from a single chicken and put it into a bioreactor and produce massive amounts of chicken meat without having to kill and slaughter animals for it. The, as I say, the investment in this is going up and to the right. It's a massive S-curve there. And we need to do this because this is a photograph I took of a, a, a rhinosaur in, in South Africa on a game reserve a number of years ago. One of the big issues is that agriculture today is taking away massive massive amounts of land from biodiversity we need to take back that land from agriculture return it to biodiversity so that we can increase things like uh, ecotourism so that we can you know give back to biodiversity and so that we can do reforestation to sequester back out of the atmosphere that co2 we're putting into it in other sectors we've got the cement sector where they're doing things like they're remediating their waste and they're also using co2 to, as, a, as a stock ingredient to make concrete now. Uh, and this, this cement that's made using CO2 as an ingredient turns out to be bendable, so it's more flexible, so it doesn't crack, it's not brittle, it doesn't require steel as rebar. So you get a double whammy there. You're putting in CO2 as a stock material, so that's a, you know, a usage of CO2 rather than it being a waste, plus you're not having to manufacture steel. Uh, Germany is talking about cleaning up its steel production. They're spending six billion on that, and ArcelorMittal in Germany are converting two of their plants to producing steel.
still using green hydrogen. And this is only going to increase. This is going to happen more and more. So there will be a big increasing demand for green hydrogen, which is why, you know, the slides at the start where I talked about green hydrogen are important. And Volvo have committed to producing fossil cars using fossil free steel by 2026. The airline industry is changing as well. United Airlines are now buying 119 seat fully electric planes from a Swedish company called Hart Aerospace. They hope to have them online by 2026. And Airbus has got this hydrogen powered blended wing craft, which they say will be flying by 2050, which is quite a bit out. But, you know, hopefully we'll get that going sooner rather than later. If we look at what kind of actions you should be taking, either individually or as an organization, you should be converting your transportation, your heating, your cooling, your cooking, you know, convert it all to electric and then switch to 100% renewable electricity. If you talk to your electricity provider, ag provider again, either as an individual or as an organization, and you demand 100% renewable energy from them, this increases the demand signal and it will make them give, it'll make them scale up the amount of renewable energy that they're producing. Measure and report your emissions. This is going to be mandated by regulations in the coming years anyway, so get ahead of that and start doing it today. Require emissions in all your request for proposals or your request for quotations. Require that your suppliers tell you the emissions associated with anything you're getting from them. And that way you can decide, based on looking at your supply chain, you can decide which suppliers you're going to go with, not just based on their price, but based on the emissions implications of that. Set an internal carbon price on all your projects. So any project you want to do, are you going to buy office furniture? Are you going to go uh, on a on a trip to somewhere? Are you going to, I don't know, whatever it is, set an internal carbon price for that. And then the money that you recoup from that carbon price, give it to the sustainability organization in your company so they can do things like they can maybe buy uh, electric vehicle chargers for your car park or something like that. And finally, tie your executive remuneration to emissions reductions KPIs. No better way of ensuring that your emissions come down than this. Last thoughts. Okay. We've said that the 2020s are going to be the decade of action. But what happens in the 2020s? What happens in the 2020s is we're going to reduce our emissions 55%. That's going to be the low hanging fruit. That's going to be the easy stuff. That means the 2030s are going to have to be the decade of way, way, way more action because it'll be harder, which means the 2040s are going to have to be the decade of, oh my God, that's a whole lot of action. Sorry, my slide went. Yep, there we go. So the 2040s are going to be that, the decade of, oh my God, that's way, way, way loads of action. We have this uh, quote from Professor Kevin Anderson, which I think is really, really interesting, where he says, we face an unavoidably radical future. We either continue with rising emissions and reap the radical repercussions of severe climate change, or we acknowledge that we have a choice and we pursue radical emissions reductions. No longer is there a non-radical option. We have to be heroes, all of us, individually and as organizations. Now is your time to start taking action. Gracias. Okay, thank you, Tom. I mean, wow, that was such a, an amazing presentation. I mean, um, as you said, uh, there were a lot of slides and so much information in there. Um, that was incredible. I, I, I did make a, a few notes as, as we were going through there. Um, cool. I think we have time for a few questions. Yeah, we've got we've got time for one or two. Um, uh, one one thing that you mentioned and I, I picked up on because it's a question that I always ask myself. We talked about some of the um, the emissions targets, for instance, like uh, that the EU has um, signed into law um, and you described them as hugely ambitious, which yeah, they clearly yeah. are. I think it's like a 55 percent reduction. So, yeah, you know, that's that, great. That that 55 percent reduction, Scott, is against our 1990 baseline. We have up to today reduced 24% against our 1990 baseline since 1990. So in, in that uh, 31 years, we've reduced 24%. In the next eight and a half years, we've got to reduce 55%. Well, that, yeah, that was going to be my question. That's a really good point, though. The fact that we, we you know, we're already along that road, 
But um, as you say, if, if you look at it in terms of the, you know, what we've achieved in that long period of time and now the short window we have, but is that where um, this implementation of all the electrification in terms of the vehicles and the renewable energy, do you think they're going to be able to hit these targets? Well, like I say, it's legally binding, so it's going to have to happen, and it's going to have to have to happen across all industries. Some of the big ones are the agriculture, the steel, the chemicals, uh, the um, concrete production. Those ones are having to take big, big, big steps, and a lot of that will be them switching away from using things like coking coal today for generating heat into the green hydrogen kind of thing that I mentioned. So that means the requirement for green hydrogen is really going to ramp up, which means, and it's important that they use green hydrogen because today, 98% of the hydrogen produced globally is produced by steam fracturing methane, which means today, hydrogen is a de facto fossil fuel. So we want to make sure that it's only green hydrogen that is being used in these scenarios. Otherwise, we're making the problem worse, not better. Yeah, of course. And um, and when it comes around to, to EVs as well, so electric vehicles, um, obviously you mentioned like the huge you know fuel savings, uh, for instance, and and the reduction in maintenance costs, which especially for fleets is is you know a major factor in why it would be adopted. Um, but I mean, one one problem we certainly have here here in the UK is regarding the the infrastructure in terms of you know charging stations and things like that i mean it, do you think that's one of the biggest hurdles that we face right now it actually is and you know if 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 i think about the uk the charging infrastructure you have in the uk is orders of magnitude better than the charging infrastructure that we have here in spain uh, if we look at the rollout of chargers the best places to get chargers in europe today are germany netherlands france not necessarily in that order uh, but there, the, the, the kind of Green New Deal that has come out after COVID is requiring companies to, in, or, sorry, is requiring governments as part of getting that funding, it's requiring them to invest heavily in charging infrastructure and in rolling it out. So while that is kind of a chicken and eggs thing, it is being, it is being forced now on governments. They are being required to do it and they'll want to do it because it will help them achieve the, those legally binding goals that they have for 2030 it's going to require they'll and they won't do it just for personal vehicles it'll be even more important to make sure that the trucking fleets have truck stops that allow them to charge rapidly as well okay um i think we're we're rapidly running out of time unfortunately um i've got a million other questions i'd love to ask you <laughs> as i'm sure as i'm sure our audience does as well but luckily we can see all of your contact details there um on screen Happy to so if questions. anyone wants Absolutely. If anyone wants to reach out uh, to Tom with any questions and uh, you can also uh, network with Tom and um, even there's a possibility of arranging some 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 one to one sessions, I believe, uh, which can all be done through um, through the event platform as well. So all that uh, remains at the moment is for me to say thank you very much, Tom. Uh, genuinely a fascinating uh, session. I'm sure we'll have loads of feedback and questions coming in. Um, so so thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Scott, and thanks for inviting me to, to present and give me the opportunity to present. Not at all. Okay, everyone, stay tuned, and uh, we'll see you in the next session.